The seven wonders of the ancient world were the seven works of man considered to be the most remarkable. They were the pyramids of Egypt, they were the hanging gardens of Babylon, the temple of Diana in Ephesus, the statue of Zeus in Olympia, which was about 40 feet tall, the mausoleum of King Masalus and Halicarnassus, the Colossus of Rhodes, which was about a hundred foot tall statue that was at the harbor of Rhodes, and then the lighthouse at Alexandria, which was 440 feet tall. Any man like the Apostle Paul, who was as well-traveled as he was, and as educated as he was, would have known about all of those. These were the seven wonders of the ancient world. And since that time, man has been able to create, he's been able to build all kinds of superstructures that have astonished all of us, and we've been amazed, and we've wondered about many of them. But the wonder of all wonders is not the work of man's hands. In fact, not even the creation of God is the wonder of wonders. But that is what I want to talk about in this message, and that is the title of this message, The Wonder of the Cross, because the cross is the greatest wonder of all. And I want you to turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's read the first five verses together. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he is unveiling his heart and telling them what he was thinking and how he was feeling when he came to visit them. And so he begins by saying, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. The Apostle Paul came to Corinth, having been imprisoned and beaten in the Philippian jail, of which you are familiar. And then, of course, he was run out of Thessalonica and Berea for teaching the Bible there. And then he was scoffed at over in Athens as he was discussing the philosophies of the Athenians and trying to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he came to the city of Corinth, he came knowing this, that the reputation of Corinth was like this, that if you had been Corinthianized, then you were morally corrupt to the intense degree, that you were morally corrupt. And so, therefore, he came to the church at Corinth, as he says, with fear and trembling and in weakness. And I want you to notice as Paul unveils his heart in these first few verses of this second chapter, what he says. He says, first of all, let me tell you about my words. He says, I came to you, in verse 1, not with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. He said, I didn't come to you with the idea of being eloquent and being impressive. I didn't come to you with the idea of wordy cleverness, and that's what he's referring to here when he speaks of wisdom. He said, I wasn't trying to make an impression. I wasn't trying to appeal to the flesh. He said, I came with this message, not a message of the philosophies of the Greeks, not a message that told you my opinion about things. He said, I didn't come to argue. I came with one message in mind. That message is the message of the crucified, risen Christ. And notice how he says it. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if you notice, he said he came with a testimony of God. The only person who can give a legitimate testimony is a person who has seen something, a person who has heard something, or a person who has experienced something. And Paul said, did not come to discuss the matters of Rome, I came to talk about, I came to tell you about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So his message was very clear. And then he says, this is the spirit, and this is the attitude I had when I came. He said, I came to you with a feeling of weakness and in fear and in much trembling. That is, he says, I felt so inadequate to do what God had called me to do among you. And not only that, he says, 
there was a fear that I experienced and there was much trembling. Let's clarify something. The Apostle Paul was not fearful of how he would be accepted or rejected. He was not fearful of criticism or rejection. He was not trembling because of his fear of how they would respond in that light. Nor was he fearful for that reason. But he says, in fear and weakness and much trembling, the thing that caused the Apostle Paul to fear and tremble, and the thing that caused him to feel weak was not only his own sense of inadequacy, but his fear of their response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which he knew that the wrong response would have eternal consequences in their life and ultimately separate them from God forever. So here's the man who unveils his heart to say, I came to you not to impress you, but to give you a message. And my weakness and my fear and my trembling was that you may not accept the powerful, life-changing message of the crucified Christ. Therefore, the Apostle Paul said to them, I want to present one message and one message alone, and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why would the Apostle Paul make a statement like that as wise and as knowledgeable as he was and as much revelation that God the Father had given him? And if you look, if you will, in Galatians chapter 6, the sixth chapter of Galatians... The Apostle Paul says in the 14th verse, something not necessarily similar, but at least it gives us an idea of the place the cross had in his life and the impression that it had made upon him and the place of importance in his preaching because he says in verse 14 of Galatians 6, but may it never be that it's God forbid that I should ever boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The Apostle Paul said, I only have one thing in life that I want to brag about, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Now listen, why would the Apostle Paul, in light of all the things that he taught, all the subjects that he covered in his ministry and all of these epistles, why would he say, I came to you with one thing in mind, the cross of Jesus Christ. The only thing I can boast of in life is the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's the reason. The Apostle Paul understood something of the wonder of the cross. He lived in a great culture at a great time, and he had seen the achievements of men, but nothing compared to what happened outside the city of Jerusalem on that day when Jesus Christ was strung up on a cross between two criminals and crucified. What is it that made the apostle Paul say, everything else fades out into oblivion when I face the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. There are two reasons for this. And many of you have sung about the cross. You've prayed about the cross. You've got them hanging around your neck on your bracelets. You've got them hanging in your home on the wall. You have them in art. The cross has become the symbol of the Christian faith. But for most of us, I'm afraid, we sort of see it and sing about it but it means little to us. And what I want you to understand is this. If I could only understand one single subject in the Bible, if I could only choose one, if I could only pick one, and that's the only one that I could fully understand, but I could fully understand that one, the subject would be the crucifixion because it is the heart of the whole Christian faith. It is the foundation of it. It is all of it. Because from Genesis to Revelation, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is to be found. And I'll show you why in just a few moments. Now, I want to say two things primarily. First of all, the crucifixion of Christ is the most important event in human history. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the most important event in all of history. Now, why is that true? First of all, because... It was a decision that was made before the foundation of the world. That is, before God ever created man, before he ever created this earth, before he ever created anything, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a plan of God already set in his mind and planned for in ages past. You say, well, how do you understand that? If you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and listen to what the Apostle Paul said in this tremendous epistle that describes our redemption. And listen to what he said. A word of blessing in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, look, if you will, in verse 4. Just as he, God, chose us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. When did he do the choosing? He did the choosing before he laid the foundation of this world. Why did he choose us in Christ? Because he knew that man would sin against him and man would have to be redeemed. How could sinful man be forgiven of his sins unless God the Father provided a means of his forgiveness and God's only means of forgiveness that was legitimate that would make it possible for God still to be true to his decrees, true to his laws, true to his commandments would be that for God himself to provide a Savior. Therefore, the cross is the most important event in human history settled and planned in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. The second reason is this, that the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest demonstration of the love of God for mankind which God ever expressed. There is no expression in all of humanity, eternity past or eternity future, that will ever equal the demonstration of God's love by sending His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into not a world of good men and women who would love Him and respect Him and believe Him and follow Him, but the Bible says that He commended His love toward us in that while you and I were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. What an expression of the love of God. He didn't have to do it. He could have sent an angel. He could have created some kind of beings and sent them. But God the Father sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who bore in His body the sin debt of the whole world. It was an expression of the love of God. God's immeasurable, His incomparable, His love that is beyond our understanding. Many things that have happened to you and to me that we have cried out to God in praise and thanksgiving. Things have happened to all of us that we've said, Lord, I don't deserve it. I thank you for it. I know I will never understand why you are so good in so many ways, but nothing God has ever done, listen, not to one person or to everyone altogether, can equal the expression of the love of God demonstrated by crucifying His only begotten Son at Calvary. Nothing in the world can compare to that. And this is why the cross is such a wonder. That here, hanging between two thieves, is the greatest expression of love that the world will ever know. God in His love, God in His grace, God in His goodness, God in His kindness, God in His gentleness toward us, saw fit to redeem us from our sins. It was the greatest expression of love. Bless the Lord, O my soul, the psalmist says, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. And he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And he begins with, who has forgiven us of all our iniquities. The greatest expression of the love of God is the sending of his only begotten son. The third reason this is the most important event in all the world, listen to what the apostle Paul said. He said, one subject I have, and what is it? He says, I determined. I made up my mind. It was a settled issue with me. What was that? That issue was that when I came, I would only come with one message, the message of the cross. Why? It is the most important event in all the world. And one of the reasons it is, is this. It is the only event that has ever taken place in human history or that ever will take place that provided for the forgiveness of mankind that provided a way that man could be reconciled to God, that provided a way that a person who was lost could be reunited with God in oneness with Him. And not only that, it was the only event in human history that made it possible for all the sin of all mankind to be forgiven, not just some sin of some men. Look, if you will, in 1 John chapter 2. The little epistle of 1 John chapter 2 Paul ex or John explains this very clearly. In the first verse of the second chapter, here's what he says. My little children, I'm writing these things unto you in order that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. That is one who stands between us and him. One who pleads our case, who pleads our cause. He says, and that is Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, that is Christ himself, is the propitiation, which means he's the all-sufficient, 
sacrificial, atoning, substitutionary sacrifice that died at the cross for your sins and mine, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Think about this. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the only event in human history in which man's sins have been dealt with in such a fashion that every single person on the face of the earth could be forgiven of their sin. Not just some sin, but all of it. Not just some people, but all people. That is, everybody was included. Once in a while, we think about the diabolical acts of some people who are so absolutely wicked. Remember this, that it doesn't make any difference how wicked, how vile, how corrupt any person ever becomes. No one has ever been corrupt enough, and no one has ever been evil enough. No one has ever been diabolical enough in order that the forgiveness provided at Calvary would not cover their sin no matter what. We may think they don't deserve to be saved. We may think they don't deserve to be forgiven. But the love of God and the forgiveness provided the cross of Calvary has covered every single, all sin of all mankind, of all ages, no exception. That's why it is the most important event in human history. No event that has ever taken place could ever match what happened at Calvary. It is the only event in all of eternity, past, present, and future, that provided for the forgiveness of man's sins and his reconciliation to God the Father, making him a child of God and bringing him into oneness of fellowship with the Lord. Nothing in the world can compare to that. But there's another reason. Notice what he says again. He says, I determined to know nothing, not anything among you except Jesus Christ crucified. Well, what was he referring to? Simply this. That if you'll think about it for just a moment, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the only moment, listen to this, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the only moment in all of human history and in all of eternity in which the Godhead was separated. That is, in eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Trinity, had always been together and been one. You say, but now wait a minute, what about when Jesus Christ was born? Would that not have separated him from the Trinity? No, because even though he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, there was the absolute oneness between Jesus Christ in his birth in the womb of the Virgin Mary and God the Father and God the Spirit. But at the crucifixion, remember what happened. The Bible says at the crucifixion when they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, the Bible says that Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The only moment in human history when the Godhead was separated, Jesus Christ was separated from God the Father. Jesus Christ was separated from God the Holy Spirit because it was in that moment that Jesus Christ was bearing the debt and the sinfulness of your sin and mine. You see, many people think that what Jesus Christ suffered was a spike or a large nail of some type through his hands and his feet and finally a javelin in his side. Well, think about it. The two thieves who were crucified on both sides of him also had spikes through their hands and also had spikes through their feet. They too were being crucified. What was the difference? Here's the difference. Only upon Jesus was the sin debt of the entire world placed. Only upon Jesus was the sin debt of the entire world being cast. Only Jesus was a substitutionary sacrifice. Jesus was a man dying. According to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he'd broken their law. These two men had broken the Roman law. Jesus Christ had broken no divine law. He was bearing the sin weight of the world. And the Bible says he cried out to God the Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that moment, he bore all of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our penalty for all of our sin, for all time, for all mankind. There is no event in all of human history to match it. It was the moment in time when even the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one of the persons of the Godhead was rejected because he bore the sin of the world. And my friend, I want to remind you of something. If you've never been saved and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, judgment 
and eternity involve one's complete, absolute separation from God, knowing that you were made by God and for God to be separated from God for eternity is the disaster of disasters for which there is only one single solution in all of life, and that solution was provided 2,000 years ago in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. There's nothing to match it, nothing to equal it, at something so important. In the mind of God, he was willing to turn his back upon his only begotten son and allow him to suffer for your sins and mine. It is the most important event in human history. Not only that, it is the most important event in human history because it is the only time in eternity past, present, or future that God died. You say, oh, now wait a minute. God didn't die. Yes, he did. God died on the cross. You say, how do you figure that? You remember what Jesus said to his apostles and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they'd get in those discussions in those early chapters of the Gospel of John? Remember what Jesus said? He said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. You know what he was confirming? He was confessing. He was declaring that he was God. He didn't say, if you've seen me, you've seen the image of the Father. He didn't say, if you've seen me, you've seen someone who's similar to him. He said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. What do the Pharisees and Sadducees do? They ripped their garments off. You know why? Because that was the most blasphemous thing that a person could say. To equal themselves with Jehovah God, whose name was so holy they could hardly speak it. And here was a man who was saying, if you've seen me, you've seen God the Father. I am the Father of one. I just do whatever I see the Father doing. Jesus Christ was God. And remember this, if Jesus Christ was not God, then the whole atonement is an absolute big eternal fiasco. Jesus Christ had to be God in order for his death at Calvary to amount to anything. Two other men died for their sins. You can't die for the sins of your children. Your parents couldn't die for you. Your grandparents couldn't die for your parents. There's only one person in the world who's ever been able to die for my sins and make an eternal difference in my life, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. His crucifixion at Calvary was the most important event in human history. It was the moment in time when God died. Now, God the Father didn't die. God the Spirit didn't die, but God the Son died. You say, well, now, what about these swoon theories? That is exactly what they are, theories. My friend, when the Bible says that Jesus died, that's exactly what it meant. D-I-E-D, died. When they wrapped him up and put him in a tomb, he wasn't swooning, he was dead. That doesn't mean that that was the end of him, just like it doesn't mean when you die, it's the end of you. Because you see, when Jesus Christ died, he continued his ministry. Entering into the Holy of Holies, presenting himself as the final Lamb of God for the sacrifice of the sins of the world. Jesus' ministry continued, but he died. And the moment he died, God died. It is the only moment in human history or in eternity when God himself died. There's nothing to match the crucifixion of Jesus. It isn't something you just hang around your neck, wear on your wrist, put on your wall at home, or put on the steeple of a church. It is a truth. Listen, it is the most important truth in the entire word of the living God. The cross of Jesus Christ, his substitutionary, all-sufficient, atoning death at Calvary that paid the sin debt of the world. There's nothing to match that. You say, what about the resurrection? The resurrection of Jesus Christ affirmed, confirmed, declared, proclaimed, shouted to the world that God's redemptive plan was real and complete. We would never, never know exactly what happened without the resurrection. But the most important event in human history was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ for your sins and mine. It is the only time God died. But then there's another reason that it's the most important of all. Listen to how Paul said it. He said, I determined. I made up my mind. It was a settled issue before I ever came to you. He said that I had one message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, there's a reason that it is the most important of all events. It is the one event in human history that cannot be duplicated and never needs to be repeated never needs to be repeated and cannot be duplicated. The ninth chapter of 
Hebrews. Look there. That verse may not be quite as familiar to some of you. The ninth chapter of Hebrews, and if you will notice, speaking of Christ's ministry, following the cross, listen to what he says in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place, in your behalf and mine, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, and that is having obtained it for all of us. It is the one event in human history that cannot be repeated, does not ever need to be repeated, and cannot be counterfeited by anything. Listen, today in the world in which you and I live, in the church, in the whole realm of religion, there is all kinds of counterfeits and duplications and all kinds of people copying this, that, and the other. God's redemptive plan cannot be copied. There's only been one Christ. He only had to die one time, and the power of that death was so absolutely comprehensive, it took care of all the sin of all mankind for all ages, cannot be duplicated, never needs to be repeated. The most important event in human history is the crucifixion of Christ. But there's another reason it is so important. What did Paul say? He says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The only thing I'm going to brag about, the apostle Paul said, is the fact that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by which I've been crucified to this world and the world to myself. Think about this for a moment. The most important event in human history because it is the only event in human history. Think about this now. It is the only event in human history which affected eternally everyone who had died beforehand, everyone who was living then, and everyone who was yet to be born. It is the only event in human history that affected everybody who was already dead, everyone who was living, and everyone who was yet to be born. You say, well, how do you figure that? For the simple reason that all the way back in the Garden of Eden, you will recall that God spoke when he spoke to Adam and Eve concerning their sin, he made this statement. He said to Satan, you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. Speaking of the one who is to come, who is the Christ. That Satan would injure him, the crucifixion, but Jesus Christ would destroy him and overcome him and triumph over him. And you recall that he made the mention again of the seed of woman. There's no such thing as the seed of woman except that that was just a hint that the one who would come to redeem mankind would be born of a virgin. And so what happens? All through the Old Testament, the whole sacrificial system, and when you think about this, what a terrible waste. They killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands and absolutely millions and millions of animals were slain in order to make a statement. That statement was this. The only redemption there is is in the blood. And when John the Baptist down by the river said, Behold the Lamb of God, here he is who takes away the sin of the world. He was the living affirmation. He was the living confirmation. He was the living declaration, the living proclamation that everything they had been experiencing, all these ceremonies down through the centuries, here was the one who was to be the final sacrifice. And you recall the Bible says that Jesus was crucified and the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. God did it. Bottom to top man could have done it. God did it. Why? Because when Jesus Christ died, there was no more reason for any more sacrifice. It had been done. It was all over. The plan predestined before the foundation of the world was complete and man's redemption had been paid for in one single act. Now think about it. God the Father speaking to Adam and Eve. And you remember the Bible says he provided them skin, so animal had to be killed, blood had to be shed. And all the entire sacrificial system was God's way of making a tremendous statement. There is no forgiveness apart from blood. And all of that, he says, was a foreshadowing of that which is to come. So that, think about this, man's redemption in the Old Testament was made acceptable in the eyes of God, not as he says, because of goats or sheep, but because of the final lamb that would be slain, Jesus Christ. 
And God gave them these things as symbols, knowing in his mind that the crucifixion was coming, and so their forgiveness was based on their faith in God and the act of obedience of shedding blood, which is a foreshadowing of the crucifixion of Christ. So therefore, without the cross, none of that would have been there. There would have been no reason for that. It would have been meaningless. It was the crucifixion of Jesus that gave meaning to every single lamb, goat, bull, sheep, every single dove that was killed. The crucifixion gave it meaning. So every person in the past was affected. Every person presently was affected. And every single person unborn was affected eternally. That includes all of us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross. You and I weren't even born. Listen, our great, 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 great grandfathers didn't even have us in mind. But Jesus Christ had us in mind. God the Father had us in mind. God the Spirit had us in mind. And the plan was laid before the foundation of the world. It is the only event in human history that affects those who were dead, those who were present, and all of those who were yet unborn, every single person involved in its effect in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because no crucifixion, no forgiveness, no security, no heaven, no home with God, everything is separation. There's no event in human history to match it. It isn't something you just wear on your wrist, something you hang around your neck, something you put on a church steeple, something you put in your home. Every time you and I sit, we should be reminded of the fact it is a symbol of the most important event that has ever taken place or ever shall take place. It is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, that's point number one. The most important event in human history. The second is this. Now watch this. Your response to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the most important decision in your human history. Your response to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the most important decision in your human history. You will never make a decision in all of your life that will affect you like this. First of all, it's going to affect the way you live in this life. How you respond to the crucifixion of Christ. It's going to affect how you live in life. And remember this. And how you live in this life affects your rewards in heaven. And your rewards in heaven affect how you are going to serve God for all eternity. And secondly, if you die unsaved, your works here on earth will determine the degree to which you are punished for all eternity. So that the most important event in human history is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The most important event in your personal history, your life, is your response to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's going to determine how you live here and how you're rewarded in heaven. But more important than that, it is going to determine where you spend eternity. There is not a single decision there's not a single event, there's not a single solitary decision that you could ever make in this life about anything or anybody to compare with this. The response that you and I make to the cross of Jesus Christ and that response in that decision to that person only determines where I'm going to spend eternity after I die. The Bible says it is appointed that a man wants to die and after this the judgment. There will be no escape from death unless Jesus comes for the saints. The most important event in your life, whether you are six when you make that decision or whether you are 96 when you make that decision, the most important decision in your personal history is your response to Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. Not Jesus as a teacher, not Jesus as a healer, not Jesus as a preacher, not Jesus as a good man, not Jesus as a fine anything. But Jesus Christ, the crucified Savior. My response to the crucified Christ will determine. It is the only thing that is going to determine where I spend eternity. My friend, it is nothing to be laughed at. It is nothing to be mocked. It is nothing to be shunned. It is nothing to be ignored because you cannot think of a single solitary event in history to match it, nor can you think of a single solitary decision in your life that's going to bear the impact of your response to the cross of Christ. 
That's why it's the most important subject in the Bible. And you can't separate it from Jesus because the cross, the crucifixion is Christ in his act of loving mercy dying for your sins and mine. Now I want you to think about something. Not if, but since. Since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the most important event in human history. And since your response to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the most important decision in your personal history, then what are you going to do about the crucified Christ? Let me remind you of something. It is not a decision that you can put off. You say, well, I'm going to make that later. No, you just made it. If you say, I'm going to put it off, you just rejected it. If you say, I'm going to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior by faith, then you have made the right response. There's no putting it off. You say, well, I'm going to do it later. The, the, what you say by doing it later, I reject it now. Because you see, you have no assurance of later. You could walk out of this place or where you are. You could fall dead right now in a split second. Your heart could stop beating and there's nothing that guarantees it's going to beat one more time for a single one of us. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? You see, it's an unavoidable, inescapable decision. The crucified Christ, the most important event in human history, and my response to that is the most important decision in my personal history. Now I want to close by agreeing with the Apostle Paul about something he said. When he said in this passage of his own feelings, now listen carefully, his own feelings about preaching to the Corinthians, he said, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. I want to say something to you. I believe any man of God who really loves God and is called of God to preach the Word of God would be constantly aware of his own personal weakness as a servant, as a saint. But secondly, would only preach the gospel with fear and trembling. Not fear of rejection, not fear of what people think, not trembling over somebody's criticism, but fear and trembling over this, that anyone would hear this great message of God, the message of the cross, not the sermon, the message of God, the message of the cross, that anyone would ever hear the message of the gospel of Christ and turn a deaf ear to it should cause every man of God to tremble and be fearful. That you would come in here on a given Sunday and listen to the truth that can change your eternal destiny and transform your life and turn a deaf ear to that, indeed, causes me to fear. The Apostle Paul said, I came in fear and trembling, fear and trembling that once I had delivered you the message, that you would walk away having turned a deaf ear. You know why Paul made that statement? Because he understood the consequences of rejecting Christ. I don't think any of us understand that. The only persons who fully understand the consequences of rejecting Christ are those who are in torment at this very moment, suffering for their rejection. But think about this. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was God and always was, if he cried out to the Father, my God, my God, you're forsaking me. If it caused such trembling in the soul of God himself, how awful it must be to be banished and destined forever from the one who created you, from the purpose for which you were created, and as he says, to be eternally separated from him and to suffer for our sins for all eternity. Don't ever forget this. The most important event in human history is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. 
The most important event in your personal history is your response to the crucifixion of Christ. And here's the right response. To be willing to say to him, Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned against you and I'm unworthy to be saved. I do believe that your death on the cross paid my sin debt in full. And I here and now receive you as my personal Savior, my Lord, and my life. If you're willing to do that, that is the only proper response to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you. And we pray the Holy Spirit will not ever let this message escape from the mind and the spirit of everyone who is listening and who will listen in times of the future. I pray the Spirit of God, your Holy Spirit, would convict and bring about faith and confession and following the Lord Jesus Christ. The time for waiting and excusing is over. This is the cross. This is your will. This is your call. Lord, that every single one of us might be obedient is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.